The mini-disc revival. What's that revival series? Friends, believe me, this is going to be my most boring video yet. And considering my track record, that's saying something. The mini-disc revival. I've covered a lot of other formats in my revival series. And requests for me to cover mini-disc have flooded in. No, they've trickled in. No, there have been one or two drips. Noah, hold the ark. <laughs> The problem is that I'm really not that interested in mini-disc. Everything else that I've covered I was intensely interested in when they were relevant back in the past. Even cassettes. Yes, I had a cassette deck once upon a time. Should I tell you what I used my cassette deck for? <laughs> Get this. Something that today would be totally legal. I copied my own records straight after I bought them so that I could listen to them as many times as I liked without the inevitable build-up of degradation. And yes, I know people are going to go crazy in the comments. Bring it on. <laughs> Thank the gods of 1982 for CD. Anyway, Minidisc. I'm guessing that most people still battling through the tedium of this video know what Minidisc is. But I'll quickly describe it for those who don't. It's a disc in a caddy about 7 cm square. There were portable players and hi-fi decks. You could buy blank discs and record on them or pre-recorded discs just like pre-recorded cassettes. Hey, they were digital, and anything digital back in the 1990s was exciting. <laughs> but the 1990s were a long time ago, and Minidisc has gone the way of the dinosaurs, dodo birds, and Tasmanian tigers. They're all extinct. But should there be a revival? Does Minidisc have any merits that would be useful to music enthusiasts, hi-fi enthusiasts, or audio professionals of today? No. And no, no, there should not be a revival because no, it doesn't have any merits that are relevant today. Other than nostalgia, of course, but you could say that about manual gearboxes in cars. Comments. <laughs> and a further no is that Minidisc wasn't even popular in its heyday. In fact, it didn't have a heyday. The public just didn't like it. It did get some niche liking from audio pros, but that's not a big enough market to sustain what was meant to be a massive commercial success. Let's go back pre mini disc to DAT, digital audio tape. That failed in the consumer market mainly because the record industry didn't like it. It was very popular among professionals and was a wonderful thing to have until we started mixing and mastering to files in our computers. DAT came out in 1987 and did very little business in the consumer market. So the big boys of consumer audio, Sony and Philips, went back to their respective drawing boards. Philips came up with the digital compact cassette, which failed pretty much instantly. There's probably a good story there, but I never used one, so it won't be me who's telling it. Sony decided that a disc format would be a good way to go, and it does have some advantages over tape. Tape is slow when you want to find a particular track. Disc can be almost instantaneous. You can't edit digital compact cassette tape, or at least I know of no way of doing it. On Minidisc, there's the possibility of splitting, combining, reordering, or deleting tracks, depending on the functionality of the machine. What's not to like about that? 1992. That's when Minidisc excited both the consumer and pro audio market. Well, I'm not so sure about consumers because I could only see Minidisc from a professional angle. Back in 1992, I was using a Walkman-style cassette recorder to tape interviews with industry luminaries such as Ray Dolby and Rupert Neve. Ray Dolby, Rupert Neve. Hey, my video isn't so boring now, is it? <laughs> Being before the time when I realised that my abilities as a musician were I also used the same cassette recorder to capture musical ideas. I know, I said a lot about the cassette format in my cassette revival video. But honestly, it was great for both of these purposes. Adequate sound and absolute reliability. But Minidisc is so tempting. So I bought one. I probably still have it now somewhere in my loft. I think it was the Sony MZ-R3, but I can't say my memory is 100% guaranteed. I never did like it. Where my miniature cassette recorder was solid and reliable, my Minidisc felt fragile, unnecessarily complicated, and probably not reliable. And yes, it did let me down. As I learned, it isn't a good idea for the battery to run out while you're recording, as the machine doesn't write to the table of contents. So the audio is on the disc, but you can't access it. I remember a friend complaining about the same issue, and he had found a way of getting the file back. 
I'd like to tell you what his method was, but I can't remember. I seem also to remember, hazily, that you had to press some button or other to record from where you had last left off. Otherwise, your earlier recordings would be erased, and that could easily be forgotten. Maybe someone in the comments can remember better than I can. So, I recorded a couple of discs, then went back to my cassette. Reliability and ease of use are wonderful things to have. I should say at this point that I also used mini disc decks with students because they were cheap enough and easy to operate. This is before computer audio. I can't remember any problems, so perhaps there weren't any. OK, so you probably expect me to have some more moans and groans about mini disc. It won't be hard. Let me go back to DAT. 16 bit, 44.1 or 48 kilohertz digital recording, uncompressed digital recording, CD quality with no data loss. I'm saying uncompressed as though it was a thing back then. It wasn't because data compression hadn't been invented. <laughs> I remember back around this time when the PR Hon show at SSL, Solid State Logic, was trying to persuade me to take a job there. Damn, name dropping again. <laughs> Over lunch in the lovely Royal Sun pub in Begbroke, he told me about a digital audio system that used a mere four bits and could achieve excellent sound quality. Seeing that I knew from my Akai S900 sampler that 12 bits were already dodgy, I didn't believe him. Or let's say that my level of scepticism was high. So now we have MP3 and AAC. That can achieve good results in the equivalent of less than two bits. My doubts have been removed. But MP3, well, the audio quality is only good considering that it's compressed. And guess what? Minidisc uses data compression. 1992 data compression. OK, the degree of compression isn't that high, so there isn't so much quality lost. But it's compression nonetheless. 1992 technology and lossy compression, of course. And that was uncompressed. Is this not a step backward? I'm going to get on my high horse here and say that professional audio should never be compressed. Not until the final output for consumers. So this massively rules out Minidisc from the production process, whether recording, broadcast, or anything else you can do with sound and make money from it. OK, rules out might be a bit strong, as I'll comment in a moment. But professional audio should be uncompressed, like that. Minidisc, a giant leap backwards for mankind. So where did it all go wrong for Sony? Well, professionally, we still had DAT. And there's no way Minidisc could have replaced that. In consumer land, people already had cassette decks in their hi-fi systems and a Walkman if they wanted music to go. If they wanted better quality audio, then there was CD in both deck and portable formats. So where does Minidisc fit in with this? It just doesn't. And was there ever a Minidisc car player? But maybe Minidisc would have had a chance if it could have held out long enough. Give it 10 years and people's cassette decks breaking down or wearing out, and Minidisc could have been the obvious replacement. Except for recordable CD. 1994 or thereabouts, I was at an exhibition where they were showing a recordable CD drive to slot into your computer. £500 it cost! <laughs> Except that it didn't look like a £500 product to me. And lo and behold, the price skidded down to around 100 very quickly, and I bought one. And so did plenty of other people. Then Apple started putting them in their computers, as standard. 1994, blank CDs cost £10. £10 each! But a couple of years later, they were a pound each. And soon after, even less than that. How could Minidisc compete with that? And then there were MP3 players, and then the iPod. There simply wasn't room for Minidisc in the market. It lingered on like a zombie until 2013 when Sony pulled the plug. If recordable CD and MP3 players had never been invented, perhaps Minidisc would have succeeded eventually. Sony improved the sound quality and brought out High MD in 2004. Uncompressed, but too late. But I'm going to close with one positive of Minidisc. A fantastically wonderful positive. It doesn't need reviving, but it was an incredible improvement on what we had previously. The Minidisc cart machine. I have to say that I never used one, but I so would have. What's a cart machine, you ask? Well, it goes back to the NAB cartridge from 1959, also known as the Fidelipak, but I never heard anyone call it that. Not to be confused with the 8-track cartridge. 
The NAB cartridge, or NAB cart, had an endless loop of tape inside, and it was used for jingles on the radio or sound effects in theatre. I used carts a lot in theatre back in the 1980s. The great thing was that you could shove a cart into the player, sometimes a triple stack, press the Q button to cue it up, then press the play button to play. The machine would then cue itself ready to play again, and a button for stop if you needed it. Three buttons. If it was invented today, it would have 30. <laughs> As a concept, the NAB cart was great. In practice, it sounded terrible. <laughs> Lubricated tape was not a good start. Pinch roller drive less than satisfactory. And among all the noise and distortion was a mangled, phasey sound that really was awful. But just good enough to be useful. And then, the mini disc cart. It was the application that Minidisc was waiting for. All of the convenience of the NAB cart and with decent, if not perfect, sound quality. I would love to have used one of these in a 2000 seat auditorium, but my memories linger on the NAB cart. Oh well, progress is good. And that, my friends, is all I have to say for now on Minidisc. I'm sure there'll be comments with more memories, perhaps good, perhaps bad. If anything sets off a memory for me, I may come back to Minidisc again. See you soon.